Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is Harold T. Shapiro, who is Professor of Economics and Public Affairs at Princeton University. From 1987 to 2003, he was President of Princeton University, and from 1980 to 1987, he was President of the University of Michigan. He is the 2003 Clark Kerr Lecturer at the University of California, a lectureship inaugurated this year by the Center for the Studies in Higher Education. Uh, Professor Shapiro, welcome. Welcome. It's a great pleasure to be here at Cal. Where were you born and raised? I was born in Montreal and raised in Montreal, went as an undergraduate to McGill University. And looking back, how do you think your parents shaped your perspective on the world? Well, I think it's a typical story. Neither of my parents had graduated from high school and they were one of many parents in that era and I guess today who thought of education as the way their children could get ahead and uh, create a better life than greater opportunity than they had. And so education was very important in our house. And, and uh, looking back, did you have any uh, uh, mentors who especially influenced you and pointed you in the direction that your life took? Well, I had uh, an uncle, for example, during the time I was in uh, primary and secondary school who was a very unusual person, very radical in that environment. He was a socialist and he taught me there were other ways to think about life. Uh, there were alternative ways to think about things and that really encouraged me and inspired me uh, to think a little more carefully about who I was and what I might become and how I might help out in the years ahead. And what did you uh, do your undergraduate major in at McGill? My undergraduate major was in economics. Right. And then did you go from, uh, from your undergraduate work directly to graduate school? No, I didn't. I was in business with my twin brother for about five years. Uh, we were in the restaurant business together, which is a business my father had been in. Unfortunately, he died when we were seniors, and they, we found ourselves in the restaurant business, and we ran that for five years before selling it and going back to school. So, so was it the restaurant business that got you interested in administration? No, it wasn't, and I didn't come to higher education interested at all in administration. I wanted to be a teacher. I wanted to be a professor, and uh, that's uh, my sojourn in administration, so to speak, came much later and quite by surprise. Mm -hmm. And, and what, what were your interests within the field of economics? I was interested primarily in economic forecasting. I built large forecasting models of both national economies like the U.S. economy and regional economies like the state of Michigan, other uh, areas, and in some cases at the international level I built models of Eastern European countries and so on. And, but, but at some point in your career, what, what led you into administration? Well, I, I got there almost serendipitously. I had served three years as chairman of the economics department at the University of Michigan. I had enjoyed that, but this was a rotating chairmanship. Everyone in the department mm -hmm. took its, uh, their turn. And while I was younger than the previous uh, chairs, it was just my turn and I took my time at that and was preparing to uh, go back uh, to teaching, full-time teaching when I got a call from the President of the University asking me if I would like to consider becoming Provost of the University. Mm -hmm. It was an astonishing call. I was very surprised. <laughs> and without going through the whole saga, I eventually decided, since I didn't have to move my family and I liked the University of Michigan very much, that I would try it out. And when I tried it out, I found it really intriguing and I liked it a lot. You, you have characterized the University President as both a manager and an entrepreneur. And, and I'm curious, what, what, looking back now, what are the skills and talents required for these two different kinds of jobs, in a way, in one job? Well, that's right. I mean, you are the administrative head of a very large organization, typically, with many employees. The University of Michigan had about 25,000 employees. Princeton has many fewer than that, but still in the thousands of employees. And you have responsibility to ensure that uh, they have satisfactory careers and they have satisfactory lives and that uh, they are treated fairly and that they uh, serve the university in ways that are appropriate. And so you, that's a totally it's sort of an administrative operation, but extremely important. The faculty and the students uh, can't do what they need to do if they don't have the support of the administrative staff and everybody that works at the university. So in that sense, you, are, um, you have administrative leadership. The entrepreneurial leadership uh, is more in the area of ideas, exploring new ground, deciding where a particular university you're involved with could really strike out and make a difference. Uh, the more distinguished the university, the more uh, sensitive they are or the more 
they face a difficulty of what I call a danger of entrenched success. Mm -hmm. When you think you're good and everybody says you're good, you get to believe this after a while. But it's my own view that uh, there's two things that are true of all universities. One is, uh, no university is as good as its own propaganda. <laughs> and second of all, no university is as good as it should be. Mm -hmm. So your entrepreneurial function is to help uh, the faculty and others who are concerned with exploring new areas, new ways of doing things, taking risks. It's very important to take risks. Uh, successful people don't often take risks once they're very successful because they have so much to lose. But maintaining leadership requires risk taking. And so that in that sense you have an entrepreneurial role. And, and so how do you move the university along into these new uh, uh, directions? Is it it's carrots and sticks? Is it conjoling, persuading, what? I think it's the power of ideas. Mm -hmm. I think it's the commitment to the future distinction of the university and the power of ideas which come from all parts of the university. And your job as president is to help the faculty and others concerned with the future of the university focus on a few ideas and eventually with you uh, select some initiatives to take on. In that way it's very different than corporate governance. In corporate governance, uh, there might be a lot of discussion going on, but eventually the CEO decides and everybody marches in that direction. Uh, in an academic institution, it's more like a partnership. Uh, you have to get people's attention. You have to get them to uh, sign up for this. You have to get them to want to go there and for the faculty to believe that their own professional futures are consistent with the area you want to go to. So it's much more like a partnership than like a corporation. And, and it sounds like uh, uh, what is required are, are political skills in part. Well, of course it's political skills yeah. in part because you have to bring together people who are in different areas, have different objectives, and get them to share a common vision of where the university might want to go. So it certainly requires those kinds of political skills. Mm -hmm. now, now you have uh, presided over uh, a great public university and a great private university. What, 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 what are the differences in, in those two uh, jobs? Well, the, first of all, I would say that there's a lot of similarities. Both great public and great private universities uh, are trying to recruit outstanding students, trying to recruit outstanding faculty. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of the things are very much the same. Most importantly, whether public or private, universities need to think of themselves as public trusts, whether they are serving the public in the way that's appropriate to their circumstances. So in those ways, they're very much the same. Uh, the principal way they are different in my mind, at least from the point of view of the president, is that when head of a public university, one of your constant responsibilities is to convince the many important and powerful groups that exist within any given state that their agendas and your agendas have sufficient overlap so that they can support you politically. So whether it's the uh, business community or whether it's the labor unions or other powerful groups in the, uh, in the state, you have to always be in a position of convincing them that your agenda and their agenda have sufficient overlap so that they can support you because their support is critical. In a private university, uh, that is an easier job. Usually the trustees of the university share the common objectives to make the university as distinguished as possible. They may have disagreements on how to do that or whether your policies are the right policies. But in general, uh, that's a somewhat easier job. And so that uh, makes it, I think, somewhat easier at a private university because the basic objectives are not at stake and it's only the agenda of the university and the public trust that it serves that are at issue here. And you have much less to do with uh, mobilizing together with and, and supporting, mutually supporting other powerful uh, political interests and important political interests. It, it seems that in, in both uh, the public and private university uh, a critical part of the president's job is mediating between the outside and the inside uh, 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 in, in various ways. Talk, talk a little about that and, and what the difficulties are there. Well, it's always very important uh, and difficult in the university to get the right balance between external and internal commitments, commitments to various types of external constituencies vis-a-vis uh, -vis commitment to internal constituencies, and it's always difficult to get that balance uh, correct. What I always ask myself in this respect is, you know, whose interests are we trying to serve? Uh, how should our programs and our, our efforts be allocated 
so that we best serve the broadest interests of society. And there are tremendous demands for universities to help other groups do things, help the public schools become better, help the professions become better, etc. Uh, and we always have to remember that we should do what we're good at. We're not good at everything. Higher education is probably not good at running uh, K-12 education. We're probably not good at running <laughs> state government. Mm -hmm. We're certainly not good at running major corporations. So we always have to condition our objectives by what we're good at, what kind of expertise we've assembled on campus, and try to match the internal versus external commitments to the actual expertise you have, as opposed to what people would like to believe you would have. Mm -hmm. Many constituencies believe you can help them, when in fact you can't, even though you support mm -hmm. them and have uh, a lot of empathy for their, for their challenge, but you're just not able to help them. Uh, was your uh, quantitative background in economics uh, helpful to you in your role as a manager? I think it was helpful, not in any a specific way, but in a general way. Economists think naturally about the allocation of resources. They think naturally about terms like opportunity cost. That is, if you move in one direction, what do you give up by not moving in another direction? So I think there's some things economists uh, know and are comfortable with that are, are very helpful. But I wouldn't want to exaggerate that too much. It's somewhat helpful. Uh, I certainly found it helpful, but uh, in a limited way. What, what in your background uh, 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 prepared you for the, the leadership side that, that you were just talking about, the, 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 the role as conciliator, mediator, integrator, and so on of, of both the campus, and the, com uh, the campus and the outside community? Yeah. Unfortunately, I have to say, there's nothing in my background I can think of that especially <laughs> relates to that. Somehow it seemed to work out okay. Mm -hmm. But I think of my background as pretty conventional and, you know, as a child of immigrants and so on who are just trying to uh, find some socially mobile path upwards uh, through education. And this is a very typical story of many, many families, many millions of families. And I think things just worked out for me. Sometimes I was in the right place at the right time. I just happened to have some set of skills and interests that happened to fit at the right time. There's a considerable amount of luck in this, and I've been very lucky. Uh, you, you write in uh, an essay uh, called uh, University Presidents Then and Now, whatever else it may be, the presidency of a university is a very human endeavor and therefore a very humbling and humorous experience. Yes. <laughs> well, you know, I think of... Uh, of humility is the most rewarding and most human of all characteristics. And my um, general observation is that having a good sense of humor and being humble are more or less go together mm -hmm. because you don't mind laughing at yourself and uh, not taking yourself too seriously. I always remember that when I went as a young faculty member to the University of Michigan in 1964, not only I didn't know who the president was, I didn't care who the president was. <laughs> I felt, you know, he would do his thing, I'd do my thing, we'd never meet. And that was just fine with me. I had no desire to meet him. And I always remind myself about that so that I don't take <laughs> my position too seriously and remind myself that the real creativity at a university is in the faculty and is in the student body. And the job of a president is to arrange things so that faculty and students can do what they need to do. In a, 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 re a recent collection which you edited with uh, William J. Bowen called Universities and Their Leadership, uh, you have a chapter uh, looking at university presidents uh, then and now. Uh, and were you surprised by any of the things that you found? Well, I was very surprised. I really compared uh, the life of a university president in the 19th century versus the life of a university president the latter half of the 20th century. And the differences were rather extraordinary, and there were really two different classes of, of differences that caught my attention. One was institutions were much, much smaller at that time. So the university president did everything from authorize the purchase of books and pencils and pens to teaching classes in moral philosophy. The student, the size of the universities were a fraction of what they are now, and the universities president's personal aura and influence on the campus was uh, very uh, pervasive. Uh, and that really uh, caught my attention. Uh, and so that was different. But the other difference that caught my attention is that on moral and ethical issues in the 19th century, university presidents, almost to a person, knew what was right. 
they knew what the right attitudes were, they knew what right thinking was, they knew what all citizens, how all citizens ought to behave, and they had pretty rigid ideas about this. Very uh, sincere, but very rigid. And so in some sense, you needed almost permission to think any differently than they thought of. They were very authoritative figures. At the end of the 20th century, the whole idea has been turned around that the university is a place where all kinds of ideas can find expression, where all thoughtful ideas can meet each other and mediate with each other. And the university president would be doing something very inappropriate to say, you know, there is one way of thinking, there's a right way to think that there's only one moral avenue to, uh, to fulfillment, and that's this one. And so that's a reflection of part of size, it's a reflection of part about our growing multiculturalism, our growing sensitivity to the differences we have. And so the university is just a very different place. It's a place where ideas commingle and interact and compete with one another as opposed to dominate one another. And, and I believe you're, you're suggesting in a way that uh, one of the reasons why the, the president's portfolio changed was uh, the, the, the emergence of scientific inquiry as such an important uh, feature of the university and a feature which in a way was automatic, that once you became a scientist and became part of that community, then a lot just was uh, happening because it was enforced by the scientific community. Well, it's not only uh, the scientific community, but the scholarly community, broadly speaking. I mean, attitudes change certainly in the area of science, as you've indicated. But they also changed in literature, and they also changed in philosophy, and they changed in the social sciences. Mm -hmm. So it was the emergence of the scholarly enterprise with a totally different kind of foundation that was so important, including, of course, very importantly, the scientific enterprise. You, you, uh, you conclude in that essay that uh, moral leadership is a realm where we have not clearly enough identified, assigned, or assumed responsibility. And, and you go on to say the more pluralistic and complex the university, the tougher and more important this task of moral leadership. Yeah. I think moral leadership is an area where presidents such as myself in the latter half of the 20th century uh, did fall short. And I teach in the area of biomedical ethics now. And when I talk to my students about ethics and I try to describe to them what ethics is, the simple explanation I give is that Ethical behavior requires taking other people's interests into account when you act. And very few university leaders, in my judgment, ever articulate out loud and in public whose interests are at stake and whose interests are they serving uh, when they act or adopt certain policies. So for example, if you ask why does the University of California or Princeton University have admission standards of the type that they do, very high admission standards, whose interests are served by such standards? Is it the interest of the society, the interest of those students? Is it our own selfish interests? And we should be able to articulate out loud why these aren't simply self-serving uh, interests. For example, I could suggest that we have high uh, academic achievement standards for students to come because it's easier to teach. We just do it to make it, our job easier. I could suggest the alternative, that it makes our job harder because these are a very smart, very able, very ambitious students, and therefore we have to work harder to, to get them excited and enthusiastic. The point is not whether which one of these is correct, but to be able to publicly articulate why it is your admission standards are what they are and whose interests are served. Then you've outlined your ethical position. The same is true on an issue you talked about before. What is the appropriate dividing line between internal and external commitments to the university, and why? Whose interests are being served by mm -hmm. setting the line in one place or another? Mm -hmm. So it's those kinds of issues which I think are very much on the minds of many college presidents and other leaders in academic life, but seldom articulated publicly. And therefore, we've lost a chance at moral leadership by just not speaking publicly about this. And is it because of uh, the, the requirements of managing the university, there isn't time to sit back and, and articulate a vision with regard to these issues, or, or what? Is it, is it cowardice, or what? I don't think it's cowardice, and I certainly don't think it's time either. I don't think either of those. It's just that university leadership in most instances, and, and I include myself in that, have just not taken seriously the ethical implications of decisions which all seem natural to them. So for example, to just go back to the example I used a few moments ago, uh, universities almost uniformly 
set emission star standards as high as they can get away with. Maybe that's the correct policy. On the other hand, it's hard to find anyone who's ever explained why they do that. Mm -hmm. And more not only why they do it, but why this isn't simply self-serving, why this actually serves the public interest. Uh, I believe myself, at the end of the day, it does serve the public interest, but very few people explain it or articulate why, and therefore they have lost a chance to explain the ethical resonance of their policies. And, and d does this suggest that on an issue like affirmative action, uh, uh, the, the university uh, has done a poor job of explaining itself because there hasn't been this kind of dialogue? Or is affirmative action a case where actually a, a successful efforts were made? I think affirmative action, there have been some successful efforts because that, it's an area which is so controversial that many presidents have spoken up on exactly why they believe uh, what they do believe. But I don't think we've gone all the way. I mean, we've talked about diversity, the necessary of training leadership from all parts of our, our society, all of which are very important and very critical and important issues. But we don't often use the framework of saying whose interests are served, mm -hmm. which I think is the critical interest, the critical issue to examine. Uh, but I think affirmative action is a bit of an exception. I think there have been some very wonderful statements in that area. In, in your writings, you, you, you uh, talk uh, a lot uh, about uh, this dual role of the university as both a servant of society yeah. and a critic yeah. of society. Is, is, that, is that duality part of the, the issue here relevant? In other words, because we, we've got to do both of those assignments yeah. well, that it becomes difficult to, to sit down and say, well, let's, let's really talk about what we're yeah. doing. No, I think that dual role of uh, the modern university is both a servant of society serving its various interests and as a critic of society standing back at an angle and trying to see if there aren't a better set of arrangements for society simply ensures that a university, if it's doing its job, is going to be a controversial place because they'll always be looking for some better arrangements to move away from the status quo to some better set of arrangements. We should welcome that controversy because it's so central, in my view, to our social legitimacy and our social vitality, uh, social relevance, and so on. I think the thing that's historically unusual is to have a government, namely the status quo, support another social institution, one of whose jobs is to criticize existing arrangements. That's what's so wonderful about the modern research university. And it's historically, very atypical. Governments don't typically support people looking for better arrangements. They support those trying to uh, consolidate current arrangements. Mm -hmm. And so that's been an unusual and important aspect. We don't take enough advantage of it. We don't take that responsibility as seriously as we ought to. Uh, you, you wrote uh, uh, in, in one of your essays, it's surely the task of presidents, that is, presidents of university, to grasp the meaning of current events for the evolution of higher education, to anticipate transformation, and to pose questions such as, and, and you list a number of questions, and the one I wanted to focus on was, to what extent are liberal democracy and free uh, scientific inquiry tied together? What, what I would like to relate this problem that you identified is, uh, to, the, to the current war on terrorism, basically, yeah. and, and ask you what you think are the long-term implications for the university community. Uh, are, are there problems that you see there uh, where the university in its role as servant uh, has to also maintain its, this view of a critic of what the society is up to? Yeah, well, first of all, with respect to the war on terrorism, this is an issue which is going to impact the whole society. And the university is impacted in some ways, just like everyone else is. Uh, so we will have certain impacts. But I think there is some potential to impact the university in a rather serious way. That is, should this proceed by asking the university in its function to, let's say, do a little more classified research, this will really undermine the university's uh, both social legitimacy and its task to educate its students. So that could be a difficulty. We may not be able, as an institution, to participate in some of the activities, however necessary they might be, within the context of a university where openness is so critical. So we may have to come to a decision that research, which might be very important, mm -hmm. 
has to be done. We hope to get good people to work on it, but they may have to do so outside the university context. I'm very hesitant about a university taking on a work that cannot be widely shared on campus, which has to be secret, which you can't go in and out of labs, you can't exchange information. Uh, that can undermine our vitality quite quickly. And while there might be extreme circumstances in which you would want to do that, I think we ought to be very cautious. And, and uh, the extent to which uh, uh, the university is being asked to take on a security role yeah. in, in identifying who's doing what kind of study, limiting uh, access of students from certain countries, that also seems to be a potential problem. It seems to me that openness is a solution to these kinds of problems. I don't see why we can't be open about who is doing what. Uh, and why don't we just publish in a book? Mm -hmm. We have a faculty directory, we have a student directory, we could say, working on this and that. I mean, I don't see what one loses by openness. Mm -hmm. uh, and openness is what we say we stand for. Uh, so I just don't understand what we have to lose by just being frank about what we are doing. I don't think there's any reason to be concerned about it, whether we tell the local newspaper or we tell the government, tell everybody. Mm -hmm. Now, if we were to only tell some people. That would be a problem if we mm. would agree to tell only someone. I'm mm. in favor of putting it all in the newspaper, I let see. people read it. I see. And, and then you don't uh, enter into a role that you might not want to have. That's right. You don't yeah. enter, but, but be free and open about what you're doing. People want to know, look it up. Now, now one of your current interests uh, uh, has become uh, the ethical problems uh, raised by biomedical research. H how did you uh, get involved in, in that the, that's discourse? I got interested in and got involved in bioethics in a serious way in 19, late 1995 when President Clinton asked me to chair the National Bioethics Advisory Commission. I had not spent a lot of time in this area. Bioethics was not my area of specialty at all. But I did spend five to six years as head of that commission with a wonderful and generous group of commissioners, most of whom had spent their lives working on bioethical issues. And it was a tremendous educational experience, but I got captivated mm -hmm. by this particular application of moral philosophy. And I've always been interested in applying the tools of moral philosophy to actual issues and that people have to confront in their day-to-day -day lives, that the nation has to confront in the formation of public policy, particularly where there's ethically contested issues. And um, in, liberal in liberal democracies, where we value uh, cultural pluralism, you're bound to have disagreements on ethical issues. And the question is, how do you resolve it? It's been a general area of interest of mine, and this opportunity to head this commission enabled me to think more carefully about this issue in the biomedical arena. And so for the last, I said I headed that commission for about six years, and the last three years I've been teaching in that area. So that's how I got into it. And, and what surprised you most in, in the deliberations of the uh, commission? What surprised me most was the public response to a number of developments in the biomedical frontier. That is, people responded with great consternation and sometimes fear, areas like cloning or uh, reproductive cloning especially, or the controversy that surrounded embryonic stem cell research, I was initially unclear what people were so excited about. And so a good deal of my own work in the last few years has been focused on that issue. What is it that gets people so uncertain in this area? What is it that's bothering them? And it's been an interesting journey, and I've learned a lot in that area since then. And, and what was bothering them? Well, what's bothering them is that the most basic of all human characteristics, in my judgment, is that societies develop narratives, which are stories which enable, the, which give some transcendental meaning to their own efforts. After all, an individual seems to be meaningless in the world of many individuals. There's forces beyond their control. Why do we all work so hard? Why do we sacrifice so much? Because we think we're, some, we're part of a larger story that's evolving. And these narratives are developed over years. They may be revealed narratives, or they may be constructed narratives. They are critical to people's lives. I know many societies who exhibit no curiosity whatsoever. I don't know of any that don't have these narratives that support their joint efforts and sacrifices. And therefore, new developments in the scientific frontier sometimes upset these narratives. Uh, you know, a number of dramatic historical examples, you know, Copernicus finding out that we weren't the center of the universe. Mm -hmm. 
or Darwin finding out that we're just part of some vast evolutionary scheme, we're not so unique after all, and, and so on. These upset narratives and people suffer really a psychic loss when the narrative they've become committed to, they become estranged from because the truth claims are no longer possible to uphold. That the, that the, un, that the planet Earth is the center of the universe, for example, or that human beings are completely unique. Uh, we may be unique in certain dimensions, but we share a common genetic code with all living uh, organisms. So the, it's these narratives that get upset. We have to therefore understand what it is that's, that that's what's upsetting people and help them resolve it and develop new narratives. You also, of course, have this enormous influence of science fiction, science fiction where science is always getting into evil hands. Mm -hmm. And that's very upsetting to people, and these new discoveries remind people about that. Mm -hmm. I think these are social issues which can be resolved and worked on, but only if we recognize them. How, how does this anxiety, do you think, affect the, the political process, and with what consequences for the university? Well, it can have very important effects on the political process. So, for example, the federal government is a main supporter of biomedical research uh, on most of the university campuses, uh, and if it decides that it will not uh, finance any work in therapeutic cloning or human embryonic stem cell research. This will cut off many opportunities for scientists who are working at universities. And so science policy becomes an important thing. And, and what, what, has there been a failure of politics to deal with these issues? And if so, why? I think there has been a failure of politics to deal with a lot of these issues. One of the reason, one of the key reasons is that the pro-life, pro-choice debate has been about the most polarizing moral debate in our country. On the political scene, it's absolutely polarizing. It, anything that impacts on that or has implications like that is very controversial. It's controversial in many countries, but we seem less able than most to come to some workable compromise which people can live with. And, and how uh, does this define uh, possibly a new program for universities in, in educating uh, students to think about these issues? Or, or have universities been doing a good job of that? I don't think universities have been doing a good job, although they're doing a better job now than before. I think that uh, the time that students spend on the university campuses, typically between the ages of 18 and 23 or 24, is a time of tremendous moral development. And the university ought to take self-consciously uh, on the notion of what in what way can the university experience assist the moral development of their students or participate in the moral development of their students. And it's everything from the kind of moral leadership I talked about before, the university explaining why they act the way they do and whose interests they are serving, but it also has to do in, with how the curriculum is organized. So that if you're teaching courses, whether it's in science or in social science or humanities, where there are ethical issues come up to explore these and to have students practice it, uh, dealing with moral problems and making difficult moral calculations and understanding that there's an immense amount of anguish when you're trying to build a better world because it's uncertain just where you're heading. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think we could be much more effective than we are in helping our students uh, in their moral development during those years. And, and I think you're, you're also suggesting that the, the, the scientific community itself has to think about engaging in this dialogue, not in a way that, that threatens their integrity as scientists, but with a, with a greater empathy for uh, the views of those people who focus on the breakdown of the narrative. Well, I think that the uh, scientific community must be involved in what I call serious conversations with the non-scientific mm -hmm. community. By serious, I mean conversations where both sides might change their mind on something. They might not, but at least they allow for the fact that they might. And it's incredibly important that scientists participate because they really understand the science in the way that the rest of the citizens do not. And you don't want any moral misunderstanding to arise just because you misunderstand what the science is really all about. So scientists, by virtue of their expertise, have a special 
uh, need to and a special responsibility to participate in these discussions. You, you write that the best of these in con conversations will include individuals of courage able to sustain a perspective, uh, 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 empathy for the interests of others, uh, uh, a perspective, a capacity to identify the key issues, and the humility necessary to recognize when their mutual views need modification. Yes, that's exactly what I mean when I talk about serious conversations. That you know, you mo both might exit the conversation thinking differently than when you went in. Mm -hmm. That would be good evidence that you picked up some empathy for an alternative point of view and modified your own perspective on the issue. Not to give up on things that you believe in, but to understand that we all have to live together in a single moral community, and that might involve from time to time some compromise. As you look back now, at having been president of both Michigan and Princeton, are, are you satisfied with the way the undergraduate curriculum has uh, uh, adapted as the, as the world has changed so much? I would say I'm partly satisfied. I think in higher education in general, the graduate curriculum is in better shape than the undergraduate curriculum. And one of the reasons I went from the University of Michigan to Princeton was a desire to really think about carefully the undergraduate curriculum. And I thought I'd have a greater opportunity to do that at uh, Princeton than at Michigan. And I think there's been some very encouraging changes. But has the adaptation been quick enough and good enough? The answer is no. That uh, the knowledge and our understanding of the natural world and the and our understanding of the human condition has proceeded much faster then the undergraduate curriculum has changed in general. So I think we have some catching up to do. And, and what sorts of things would you like to see happen, do you think? Oh, I would like to see uh, the focus of courses in all across the curriculum really shift in somewhat, mm -hmm. in a way that more quickly reflects uh, our rapidly increasing knowledge base. Uh, any biology course that looks the same as it did 10 years ago just misses mm -hmm. some critical points. Uh, the same thing is actually true in literature and even in economics. Uh, so that I think uh, the scholarly frontier and our understanding of the human condition is, is moving at pace mm -hmm. and generally curricular developments are lagging that. Now, I don't want to paint, paint too bleak a picture. I think uh, things are moving at the undergraduate level. And, but I think they need to move a little faster. Uh, if if uh, students were to watch this tape, how, how would you advise them uh, to confront the challenge of their own education? Well, I think the main thing I would uh, tell students is when you enter college, you have to think of yourself as taking responsibility for your education. Generally, university rules are so complex, you can always find someone to sign off on any, almost any uh, <laughs> course, <laughs> things you want to take. You can sort of create your own uh, education, but more importantly, you're in charge. You'll have some great teachers, some teachers that aren't so great, but all those experiences will become important if you take charge of your education. Uh, so you've passed the high school stage where someone else is in charge, and now you have to take charge and take full responsibility as an adult. Now, if you go to any of a large number of great schools like Cal or other places, you will find a lot of assistance in that. The faculty will take your education seriously, so will many others, and you'll have a lot of assistance. But at the end of the day, you have to take responsibility for your own education. So when one gets an assignment, you can either just do it, or you can take responsibility for this and make it as wonderful and as broadening experience as you possibly can. And it's that attitude that you are responsible. You'll tell help where you can get it, uh, but you are responsible in the end, I think, is the most important thing I'd have to say. If you look back at your career in, in administration, what, what do you see as the most difficult challenge, uh, the most difficult problem that you had to navigate, and, and uh, you, you are most satisfied with what was accomplished? Well, it's difficult to pick out any one particular initiative I would say the main thing is to keep focused. Decide on a small number of important things and just keep relentlessly at them. No leader, single leader in higher education can do more than focus on a, a modest number of problems and really uh, contribute to change. Uh, so that there are many things I've been very lucky. I mean, uh, none, I didn't accomplish anything alone. I accomplished it sometimes by luck, sometimes by working with other people, sometimes just by nature of circumstance, mm. sometimes because I had a good idea that worked out in its time. You need a lot of things to make uh, something happen. 
But you have to keep focus on a small number of big issues and not get distracted on today's latest controversy is, is the most important issue, I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, if, if students were to watch this tape, I'm, I'm curious, what, what theme might they find in, in the story of your intellectual journey, both as a, as a scholar and as a minister of universities? I think they would find respect for students, uh, understanding that in the end of the day, their interests are, are probably our primary concern. I think they would find uh, respect for scholarship and for the university's role in that arena. Those have been the two animating facts of, of my own devotion to universities. But I think they would also find what I've tried to understand, namely that we are trying to have an undergraduate or graduate experience that will serve the kind of society we aspire to be, that our goals and our aims are directly related to the kind of society we would like to live in. And that we ought to design everything towards that end, including our students' curriculum and who they are and what kinds of people they are. And so educational reform for me, educational change, is a kind of mini social protest movement, saying that we could be in a better place, we ought to be in a better place, and we can do something about it through our education and scholarly programs. And, and does this uh, a sense of your priorities go back to that uncle that you talked about at the beginning? Well, I don't know. Probably to some extent <laughs> it does. Yeah. I ended up uh, as an adult having very strong disagreements mm -hmm. with his particular solutions, but he got me to think about the problems. Uh, on that note, uh, Professor Shapiro, I thank you very much for, for joining us for this conversation and actually coming to the campus to give the, the Kerr Lectures. Thank, thank you. Thank you. It's a great honor to be here. And thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history.